Is this myself? My name is Francis Cole. I traveled last night from D.C., which is just a short distance away. Um, I've been in D.C. for the past decade working with the federal government. Um, I worked for the State Department for that whole time on international affairs. I was specifically in charge of science, technology, and innovation policy with regards to our international relationships with other countries. Um, I'm a scientist by trade. I have a PhD in developmental neurobiology, um, and I ended up translating that into a diplomatic career, working on science diplomacy issues for a long time. And for a long time, I was the highest ranking Latina at the State Department, working on any type of technical science issues, um, which was a great honor for me. Um, when NBC Latino first called me to say, can we interview you? You're the highest ranking Latina scientist in the entire US government. Pero hacemos con gusto, and I had a lot of flexibility during those years to speak to my community, um, um, do it on behalf of the State Department, but also be able to speak to domestic audiences about the importance of science, technology, STEM, representing my Boricua community was very important to me as well. And so during that time in DC, I would get together with Boricuas a lot, and siempre de alguna manera o otra terminaban diciendo. <laughs> you know what they should do in Puerto Rico? I have this idea for this thing they should do in Puerto Rico. And well, how many of you have had that conversation? <laughs> so a group of, of, of friends and I decided to stop having that conversation and no action. And we decided to put together a group of diaspora in DC that wanted to get together once a month. Um, and <coughs> find ways to empower civil society on the island. And we formed a group called Senadores with a C, because we get together salon style over una buena comida. <laughs> and we started meeting three years ago, and we're now a nonprofit, um, and we have a full platform, and you can visit us, senadorespr.org. <coughs> and we have 40 partners on the island. We have invited speakers every month from the island to tell us what is happening on the island, how we can help them from their perspective. We've done a number of projects, which I can talk about during the Q&A as well. Um, and now that we're all here, I think that what's important about the conversation we're going to have is that we've all had that feeling. We've all had that conversation. We're five million in the diaspora. We have amazing networks. We're doing great work. Some in that diaspora have extended resources whether it's through expertise, <coughs> through connections, through their education, through the institutions they're affiliated with. That's a source of tremendous power for the situation in Puerto Rico. We have opportunity, <coughs> economic engagement opportunity, we have political engagement opportunity. Our wallets, our voices, and our votes are very important for what's happening in Puerto Rico. And so the four people that are in this panel today have been doing this work for a long time. Some of you know them very well. Some you might learn about today for the first time and the work they're doing. I am going to do my best to introduce them um, uh, with all they are due, um, but they will do a much better job than I can. I'm going to start immediately to my left um, with Natasha Otero Santiago. Natasha is a public relations professional with over 20 years of experience in the U.S. Hispanic market. She's the principal of NOS Communications, which helps small businesses and Fortune 500 companies create public relations and social media campaigns. She's the founder of Paranda Puerto Rico. She's been named a top digital influencer by Latinos in Social Media 2016 and 2015, and a mujer legendaria by Ford Motor Company. To her immediate left is Raúl Lucy. He's the chief executive officer of Acacia Network, the largest Puerto Rican founded organization in New York. He was born in Patillas, Puerto Rico, and relocated to New York appointed by the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation and has served as Chairman of the New York State Parole Board since 1990, as well as being the first Latino Sheriff of the City of New York. <laughs> Immediately to his left is Isabel Ruyan. She's the co-founder and managing director of Comprometidos, and that's, I think that's kind of witty, Con PR Medidos Comprometidos. Um, this organization focuses on connecting people in order to foster commitment with the personal, social, and economic development of the Puerto Rican communities wherever they are. They recently 
um, in the past few years, launched a network called Puerto Rico Global, which seeks to connect people from here with people from there. And she's going to talk more about their model. Um, Isabel is also a proud fellow of the Rockefeller Foundation for Global Program on Social Innovation, the only Latina ever recruited to that program. <laughs> and to her left <laughs> is Hector Figueroa, president of the 32BJ Service and Police International Union, the largest property service union in the country in 2012. He was born in the labor movement in Ponce, Puerto Rico, where his parents, as teachers, were part of a long struggle to win a union at work. Hector came here in 1982 after being banned from university for participating in a student strike. Very relevant to the time we're living. <laughs> Driven to continue his activism, Hector started the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union, now Workers United, in 1990 as one of the first leaders in the labor movement to speak out for immigrant rights. So join me in giving them an applause for the work they've done. <laughs> not a small task. What we are proposing is that the diaspora can become engaged. It's alive. It's alive. <laughs> the diaspora can become engaged and can help Puerto Rico. Es sencillo. El problema es cómo. Porque cuando empezamos a tener esas conversaciones, la cosa se pone difícil. El cómo se nos ha hecho bien difícil. Y tenemos una historia larga de luchadores en nuestra comunidad Increíble. ¿Cómo canalizamos eso? How do we channel that energy, that talent, those networks? This is priceless. We need to figure out a way. And so what I am going to do is I'm going to ask each of those, each, each of you to speak to how you have done that through your organizations, how you have engaged the diaspora in the issues of Puerto Rican communities. And then we'll, I want you to add in to that explanation what has worked and what hasn't worked, and why. Because that is the conversation that we need to have to get to where we need to go. We're going to start with Natasha, and we'll go down the line. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. I hope everybody had their coffee, and you know we're excited with the first um, opening remarks we had uh, this morning. Um, I was lucky enough to be here for the Diaspora Summit 1, and I was very lucky to be also in Holly, on Holyoke. And my work is in South Florida. I have lived 20 years in the South Florida area. And around five years ago, um, over Mofongo, over, yeah, the only place basically that had Mofongo in South Florida, um, I met with Giovanni Rodriguez. And Giovanni Rodriguez was from Silicon Valley and he writes for Forbes, he's an entrepreneur, he is an amazing, amazing intelligent person that was working with a White House educational um, initiative at the time for the Hispanic community. And we met, and he said, oh, I'm Puerto Rican from the upper borough of Puerto Rico, the Bronx. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, let me take you to have some mofongo. He hadn't had mofongo in years. He was on his way to TEDx San Juan, which TEDx San Juan was the first time they were doing it in Puerto Rico. It was like five years ago. And I took him to Wynwood. If you know Wynwood, Wynwood is the, it was called Little San Juan. It was the only area of South Florida where Puerto Ricans were lived um, for many, many years. Um, and now it's actually a little Williamsburg. So Wynwood has had a gentrification process where Puerto Rico has almost been set aside and the Puerto Rican culture is not celebrated, where it was the only place in South Florida. So over Mofongo, and to make it quickly, I told him what I had started at this little restaurant called Jimmy C's Kitchen, where I had started just um, a concerts of Bomba y Plena. They started with 100 Puerto Ricans, and by the time I saw Giovanni five years ago, he had turned into 400 people going to this Bomba and Plena concerts. I saw a need, a need for the Puerto Rican community to get together. What we're talking about, that unity factor, that diaspora solidarity factor that it's missing from a lot of our communities. How do we get them together? That's when we decided to, he was like, oh my God, we need to have a network that will unify this diaspora. And Parranda was born, Parranda PR. Um, it was a network, it's in social media. Social media at that time, five years ago, was just starting. We started and still are very much committed 
to everything that is happening in the United States and in Puerto Rico. Always our aim was to create bridges of communication, offline and online, to be able to create those partnerships that five years ago, they were not happening. Puerto Rico did not really care that much about the diaspora, and the diaspora had disconnected many times from Puerto Rico, other with a melancholy and nostalgia that they brought, which is why these concerts were so important. At the end, by the time that, you know, in five years, in, you know, by the time we ended, we would celebrate Noche de San Juan, we would celebrate Las Fiestas de San Sebastián, we would celebrate Las Octavitas, and we could see all these Puerto Ricans coming from Orlando, from Tampa, from Homestead, in this little place, getting all together just to hear traditional music from their island. So yes, it works. It works to bring people together through their customs and their traditions. But it, it also is the time already that this diaspora community solidify as an advocacy groups. It is time to stop, like I say, um, getting together because of La Botella y La Baraja. And it's time already to put our foot down and say we are a political power. We are a community power. And I think that is the test for all these diaspora organizations. Um, did I answer your question? Yes. Yes. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yo nací en, en el barrio de Apiadero, en Patilla. Um, lo ha dicho otras veces, y lo voy a decir de nuevo. Le dicen Apiadero porque se va a pie. Y se, <laughs> y, y se va a pie hoy. <laughs> eh, por la primera vez, um, uh, hace como un mes, yo fui a, a, a donde estaba la casa de mi, mi, mi madre, mis padres, mi abuelo, y pude llegar en un Jeep. With four wheels, you know, four wheel drive, porque uh, es la primera vez en toda mi vida. De, de, de allá a aquí, uh, hay muchos años. Uh, uh, fui policía en la ciudad de Buffalo. I was a police officer in Buffalo, the first Puerto Rican police officer in the history of the city of Buffalo. Uh, there were 20 Puerto Rican families in Buffalo, New York. Uh, my father helped build the first Puerto Rican social club uh, in mm -hmm. Buffalo. And this weekend, I happened to go to Buffalo because we're working on a project in Buffalo. And I was able to take one of my BPs, and, and we had a beer, and we danced a little merengue at the club that my father built. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a great experience. And uh, it was in Buffalo that I, I, f I first had my experience about ese tirijala entre los de allá y de acá. My sister uh, was a member of a group back in the 60s that thought they could go to Puerto Rico and, and tell Puerto Rico how they should deal with the crisis they have regarding the state of independence, you know, status thing. And they got quickly exited from Puerto Rico. And when she came back, she told me the story. And, and I said, well, good for you. Uh, you know, we're here, they're there. You know, you have no business going down there telling people who are living there every day, struggling to it, how, you know, what to do. Uh, and that stayed with me for a very long time. So as I worked through the political system, and you know, the, the bio has a little more to that, uh, all along in my mind, I always said that uh, going to Puerto Rico, where there are Puerto Ricans just like me, spot, m many, many, many smarter than me, hardworking, all the traditions that I remember from my family, that I thought it would be really, um, I can't even describe the word, to go back and tell people that I knew better than they did, right? Uh, and tell them how to do things. And then a few years ago, um, I was given an opportunity to, to grow this organization, the Acacia Network, and I'll correct only one thing in the bio. It's the largest Puerto Rican organization in the nation, Acacia Network. Here, founded in the Bronx, in the South Bronx. Um, and the bones, on top of the bones of the diaspora citizens that came to this country, people like Ramon Velez and Antonete and, you know, Gomisindo, Hector, D, all the people that worked, worked in those Bronx and many before that. Acacia Network came from that foundation to become the largest Puerto Rican organization in the nation. And I was talking to a tax syndicator one day and he was telling me that he was wanted to do some work in Puerto Rico and would I be interested in going down. I said, you know what, I resisted that because, you know, 
I'm sure there are people smarter than I am down there that do that. I don't know that I could walk in telling people what to do. He said, you know, Raul, why don't you fly down with me? Talk to some other people down there and see how it comes out. So I went down. I met a young man named Oscar, um, who was uh, the ombudsman for the the senior uh, division of the, of the Puerto Rico government. And uh, we had a conversation about that. He said, Raul, um, you're wrong. You're wrong about that relationship. We're a Puerto Rican nation. It doesn't make any difference whether you're here or there. We're all one people. And if we can help each other in any way, boundaries should have nothing to say with that. We should be working together and whatever. You have a great organization and there are some needs here. Why don't you go tell, talk to the mayors of the cities, talk to the people in government and see what they think. Talk to the people and see what they think. So we started for two years visiting the mayors, government agencies. And every time we told them the story about Acacia, they said, wow, it would be great to bring that organization work with us here. And we eventually agreed. We put together a group that had one person from here, a young lady, Limaras Arboy, a woman, and a, a bunch of folks from Puerto Rico. And they put together a project that today is a $20 million project, 103 units of housing in Tuarta, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. six months in the ground. Almost everybody that's on that team, everybody's Puerto Rican first, almost all the team, including the workers, the construction companies, the architect, are all from Puerto Rico. The only person on that team that's not, that's Puerto Rican, but not from Puerto Rico, at least it's Limares. And uh, so the dollars stay there. We invested a million dollars. You know, the reality is that we brought our million dollar back. But do we ever walk in and invest a million dollars? And the risk in Puerto Rico, people said, don't do it, don't do it. Well, we did it, and guess what? Working with the uh, people in Puerto Rico, not making judgments of whether they were from here or from there, we put together this great $20 million project. And, and 103 viejitos in Puerto Rico are going to have beautiful apartments in Tuarta. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna have work jobs for the people there. It's going to be the, one of the most beautiful places in the town. And when we leave, you know, the people who are going to manage the project are from Puerto Rico. We'll be interconnected. We have a connecting company. And we're looking out at three other projects. And um, I started with the governor from one party. Uh, last month, I went down and I visited with the new governor. And he's, exci he's as excited as the other governor was. So the politics <coughs> transcend that. It doesn't make any difference. You know, en apiadero todavía tienen la pava en los palos, right? So that's where I grew up, but that doesn't make any difference. And uh, when you can, this, for me, for me, everybody's different. When you disconnect all that turbulence and just see ourselves as one people working on common issues, because I can tell you a whole story about the issues we're working on here, and you start working, all that stuff disappears. So people that I worked in Puerto Rico, we talk about the politics, we talk about the government, we talk about the president that we have here, we talk about the governor over there, but that does nothing to do with the work that we're doing. We're working on a project to, to give the people of Puerto Rico housing. And that's the way I work. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Hi, uh, my name is Isabel Ruyang. And um, as almost five, five years ago as well, a conversation similar to the ones Frances had with her friends, we, uh, with a group of other four friends, we were talking about what we can do to help Puerto Rico. And like, we have so many people that we know and so much talent, collective talent, and we're not using it for Puerto Rico. So we decided to find the, found the organization, and, and we did it from New York, D.C., Miami, and San Juan. And uh, we did it because we realized that our biggest asset is our human capital, and we have over 5 million Puerto Ricans living abroad, people like you with amazing talent, knowledge, connections, but we weren't necessarily bringing it back to the island or connecting it back to the island. And while everyone was lamenting that we have all these people, Puerto Ricans that are leaving the island, we see it as assets that we, if we use them properly, we can expand Puerto Rican uh, companies to become global companies. We have contacts everywhere around the world. So after you know the idea, when we started the organization, we have five <coughs> different projects. And uh, to the years and a half later, we realized, okay, we need to focus. So we focused on the one issue, which was uh, Puerto Rican engagement, for, uh, diaspora engagement for economic development. And we launched here in New York the Puerto Rico Global Initiative 
which was uh, the objective of really connecting Puerto Ricans in, in order to help each other out. And we did it through a digital platform, PuertoRicoGlobal.org, which is a, a, it's like a mix of LinkedIn and eHarmony, where you can uh, ask what type of help you need, and, and, it, and the idea is it connects you with another Puerto Rican. And we had, we've had a success in building a network um, we have over 1,500 members registered, and we've been talking in different cities. Um, but the, we realized that our biggest uh, success stories was what we did outside that digital platform, where the conversations we had on the side. It was the email, direct email introductions we did with people. It was the Puerto Ricans that we brought back to be speakers in local conferences because we were tired of listening to the same people be the speakers in the local conference in Puerto Rico. And we started to talk to them and, and tell them, you know, we have so much talent, why don't we bring Puerto Ricans that are abroad to be the main speakers? We've been listening to the same people over and over again. In one year, in four different concerts, we have the same speakers and we have so much talent. So we started bringing people back to be speakers. Frances was one of the speakers in Animos um, and many other Puerto Ricans in different cities. We also uh, helped uh, Parallel 18, which is a, um, an incubator of startups in the island to also uh, be able to reach mentors, inter mentor, Puerto Rican mentors that are abroad to be mentors for local startups in Puerto Rico. And we were also able to connect uh, Puerto Ricans to be uh, mentors to non-profit organizations. And um, we, were, we also got uh, young people that had been working abroad for maybe eight years but wanted to come back so we helped them get uh, get job opportunities in the island as well so out of that experience what we've learned is you know the digital platform is wonderful but the biggest connection is when you connect people in person and where you strategically connect people so now what we are working on is transferring that digital network to be more live component and so we, one of the things that we, we've been also doing is that people that have been completely disconnected from the island or come to the island only for vacations have been writing to us, you know, I'm going to Puerto Rico, I've been going for the past seven years to Fajardo, I have no idea what's going in the private sector and in the entrepreneurial sector, but I want to get involved and I want to know what the opportunities are. So can you help us connect us with local, you know, leaders and players? And we're sure. So we started doing those connections. And now we realize that's what we have to be doing. We have to be coordinating more of those trips. Because what happened was that when people came to the island and they saw that there's this startup business incubator, there, that there are 40 startup companies that are coming out of, you know, millennials that are creating these companies. When they went to the Science and Technology Trust and they realized all the science projects that are, have been, are being created in Puerto Rico, or when they went to ir a Calle Loiza because we recommended them uh, local restaurants and they saw that uh, Santurce is being transformed, they were like, wow, you know, there's positive things going on in the island. You know, it's not, everything is not negative news and I want to get involved. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to start, you know, creating uh, more of these kind of trips. And so, yeah, that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> Thank you. Buenos dias. Good morning. Um, I'm going to, to talk in, in at two different set of uh, preoccupations. You know, the first one that brought us here and motivated us to create Vamos for Puerto Rico, which mm -hmm. uh, we spell as Vamos, the number four, and Puerto Rico, because uh, it's uh, right now a network of uh, over 100 organizations, uh, including incredible work that's happening through the East Coast, uh, uh, connecting community groups, labor, interface, uh, in, in having uh, uh, an action network, really, to respond to the debt crisis. Uh, I'd like to share that experience with you. i also like to uh, reflect a little bit on the, on the needs of the diaspora from our organizational point of view very quickly, and then we may have time to, to set that in the context of, of the discussion. Uh, we started VAMOS uh, out of a preoccupation that uh, in the middle of the debt crisis and the fiscal uh, uh, problems that Puerto Rico faced, we felt that there was uh, a voice lacking that could insist within the diaspora um, about the need of looking at this from the perspective of working families. And that could unite not only 
organizations and individuals who care about Puerto Rico because there is an emotional tie to the island, a family connection is part of our heritage, is who we are, but also people who care about the situation happening to workers in Puerto Rico, uh, the tremendous uh, uh, impact that this crisis is having on the elderly, on children, on working families, the uh, loss of benefits and conditions that workers enjoyed in the middle of the economic problems. And so that uh, in that crisis, not just a Puerto Rican issue, but an issue of working people that resonated with them here in the States, because we were finding that people who are non-Puerto Rican, who are working people, uh, are going through the same kind of tribulations, the same kind of missed opportunities, the same kind of challenges. So our effort and approach was how can we connect uh, you know, the diaspora through also organizations uh, like the, the Hedge Clippers, like uh, uh, the Working Families, Made the Road New York, and others who are already in the grassroots and looking at how communities of uh, uh, the working poor can organize themselves and win uh, more economic justice. So we went into this venture, uh, and uh, uh, what really worked was that uh, there is already a group of uh, Puerto Ricans in positions in the labor movement, for example, along the East Coast and in Puerto Rico, uh, that talk to each other, that know each other, that we're trying to cement uh, into a greater relationship. So using that base, which brings resources and brings the, the connection to Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican com communities and other groups of workers and worker advocates, uh, we began then to uh, invite and extend it to uh, entities like Latino Justice and others who have a trajectory of working in our communities. Uh, in Boston, and you're going to hear from that experience from Otoniel, who is here, uh, uh, there has been uh, a formation of an alliance that has been very active. So when there was a need to respond to the actions of the hedge funds uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in their increasing concerns over the debt, or the need to respond from the perspective of our organization to uh, the, the passing of PROMESA and the Fiscal Oversight Board, uh, in Boston, we have a network of people who can actually do that relatively quickly. Vamos right now is also active all along the East Coast, in Florida, in Philadelphia, in Connecticut, uh, in Chicago, and even in the West Coast, we did actions on March 22nd. We come to this from the perspective, and I'm not going to hide that from you, and Toshi is on the second uh, issue of uh, reflecting on how the diaspora organizes. Uh, we see the crisis of Puerto Rico as the most profound crisis that is affecting not only Puerto Ricans, but any group of working families, of working people uh, under the U.S. flag. There is nothing more profound. The debt crisis is far deeper than what Detroit went through. Mm -hmm. And the challenges that our people face are unique in our history. And if we don't approach it from that perspective, it's really uh, you know, uh, a missing opportunity. That doesn't uh, necessarily translate that effort of uh, the ones that the other panelists have talked about should not be supported and should not be encouraged. On the contrary, we need to find a way for addressing the economic and the political crisis and make sure that those issues resonate in the community. But we also need to build a strong civil society in Puerto Rico that goes past the, uh, the, the stalemate of uh, political discussion that exists on the island and tries to improve the lives of working people because uh, we are living through a profound humanitarian crisis. I want to end by saying that uh, from our perspective, we need to focus again on four things. Uh, we want to really address the debt crisis immediately. We think that the debt is unpayable. We like uh, other people who agree with us that the debt is unpayable to put pressure uh, in the restructuring of the debt process, on the fiscal measures, to put public services and the life of working people first and the needs of uh, the bondholders and the financial institutions second. Uh, the other piece of the program is we believe that we need to look at the situation of working people in Puerto Rico, including those who are in unions and those who are not. Uh, and that in the diaspora, when you look at the diaspora, the largest majority of people are working people. So how do we increase the power that those workers have over their lives, that they can pay their bills, that they can be paid fairly both here and elsewhere? In Florida, we have been organizing in the airport sector. We raise wages in Fort Lauderdale, and many, mm -hmm. no, many of those workers are Haitian, but also Puerto Ricans, mm -hmm. from $7 to, uh, you know, now going to be $14 an hour. 
uh, you know, we did something similar here in New York, in Boston we're fighting for that too. How do we make the, the fight of the diaspora be not only about us as Puerto Rican, but also us as a majority working people? Uh, so the efforts uh, in the business sector, the efforts on the community sector, find themselves with partners that are strong in the working uh, movement sector. And then last, uh, we look for long-term solutions for Puerto Rico. We have engaged uh, uh, with intellectuals, policy makers, to try to look for ideas. Uh, and in Puerto Rico, there is a very strong coalition called VAMOS that we echo on the island. And they have numerous ideas on how to move forward on that. And last, I want to end with this. We need to make Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rican community, uh, of the five million that Francis mentioned, three million are in states that our union is present. Uh, in the East Coast. We need to make Puerto Rico again uh, a priority in the political, uh, in the, within the political class in the United States. We are not going to do that simply through the elected officials and those who hold office. We also have to make it a preoccupation of those who are at the grassroots, those who are fighting for unions, those who are fighting for civil rights, those who are fighting for environmental justice. They need to see Puerto Rico as uh, ground zero of what solutions we're going to offer to the problems of our time. And uh, that is tied to the political power of our numbers in the United States. Uh, we need to make sure that no politician, no movement, no organization can get away with ever thinking about what's happening in Puerto Rico and what the needs of our community here in the States are. Thank you. <laughs> I heard a couple of lessons in just your initial comments. Um, we've done a great job of uh, raising the visibility of our culture, um, the thing that makes us very special. But that it's time to expand that reach into advocacy and organization. I heard from Isabel that they have learned that personal contact and being really in touch with people has been very important in order to get people organized and, and mobilized around things. I heard from Raul that it's very important to set aside political agendas and get over the fear of los de acá y los de allá, because there is a hunger and a need um, for your expertise and your help. And he found that in Northern Ireland. I want to address a question that was brought in from the main room, which I think is important for this group. Um, and it's, the diaspora has come in many waves. And you know, historically, um, there have been waves here in New York, but also different waves that have populated our diaspora throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. And those diasporas get involved politically in different ways and at different degrees. And so one of the questions we got out of the main room was how can we facilitate, how can we help Puerto Ricans that come from Puerto Rico here vote in the elections, help them get involved politically. But let's start with that, with the vote. Um, how do we get them energized? How do we get them to raise their voice for Puerto Rico and for the issues that they care about, their education, their families, workers' rights? How do we get that to happen in the diaspora here? <laughs> and I, well, sorry, because she's done this work in Florida. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sure, yeah. <laughs> it is interesting that you asked that question, because I was going to say that um, Regardless of what happened in the elections and our political parties' affiliations, um, I can actually say I was depressed for the last three months, um, so you can tell. <laughs> but then I realized um, the good thing that came out of this election for the Puerto Ricans and in Florida. And that's the work that, and Jimmy's here, mm -hmm. and heads to Jimmy, to que vote mi gente, to movements that, you know, Florida, you know, they put a lot of pressures on the Puerto Ricans in Florida. We were going to carry the elections. We were going to do this. We, and it was a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility. And at the end of the day, you know, when happened what happened, um, suddenly the, the Puerto Rican vote was like, what happened? Weren't they supposed to be our saviors? But behind all that story, the real story was that we doubled the political presence of Puerto Ricans holding office in Florida. It's wonderful. We elected Darren Soto, the first representative from Florida, to the U.S. House. 
we elected the first Puerto Rican to the Florida House in 60 years from South Florida, Robert Asensio. Robert Asensio actually was a policeman, a chief of police who retired and who decided that he could see a movement of Puerto Ricans to South Florida, that by the way, does anybody know the number of Puerto Ricans in South Florida? 300,000. Out of the million in Florida, 30% of the Puerto Ricans are in South Florida. Mm -hmm. And most of them have gotten there in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they are Puerto Ricans either from the island, a lot of them, or from New York and moving, you know, because they're tired of the cold weather, <laughs> basically. But we have a very, so Robert Asensio, since Maurice Ferre, Maurice Ferre was a mayor. He was a Puerto Rican mayor of the city of Miami. And since then, 60 years, there hadn't been a Puerto Rican in that kind of power in South, from South Florida, okay? This is what the example of what we can achieve if we get together. I'm not going to say that, you know, it was, it was getting all this Puerto Rican, it was about talking. Robert Asensio, he won by one vote. One vote. But you know what? The importance of him, he was the one seat in the Florida House that by him winning, and here I'm going Democratic, the Republicans didn't have a supermajority in the Florida House. Look how Im important the election of Robert Asensio, for me it was because he was Puerto Rican, regardless of what his party was, that we were able to push him into power. And he's forgotten because it's like, everybody's like, oh no, it's Orlando and Tampa and I'm not, whatever, I'm that. And, I, and I'm like, no, but we did this little thing where this guy who nobody paid attention to, the Democratic Party didn't pay attention to him, they didn't give him any money, they didn't, whatever, we pushed him because we knew the people that lived there and worked there in South Florida, how big that Puerto Rican community has become. Huh? Right. Yeah, and so what we're looking now, and it's about this diaspora solidarity, is how do we make, expand this kind of movement and this kind of commitment to our community, like Vamos por Puerto Rico, like Comprometidos, like Acacia, which is the largest, the Puerto Ricans in South Florida, how do we stop el caciquismo, because they exist, of everybody wants to be a cacique, and it, this comes from Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> that's why we were Tainos. Caciques, and there are more Indians in the mix. And we realize and support and identify Puerto Rican leaders. The elections are coming in 2018. Let's get that vote out. What is happening, to, to your question, and I'm sorry, I'm like, about the Puerto Ricans that are coming, I can talk about the Puerto Ricans in South Florida. They're still very much involved with Puerto Rican politics. A lot of them either don't register or when they register, they don't go out and vote. And that is sad because you have to make what something taught us about this election and about the PROMESA bill and about everything that is affecting Puerto Rico is like it or not, Puerto Rico is a colony. And the decisions that are being made about Puerto Rico, sorry to say, are not being made in Puerto Rico at this moment. Mm -hmm. And so the Puerto Ricans that are here really need to go and vote in their local and their regional elections. It's not every four years. I could care less who's the president right now. You know why? Because I am committed that for 2018, and we should all hear in this room and in this diaspora summit, because we can come together, 600 of us, and if we get out of here and we don't do anything, we have to be committed that we're going to go and vote, identify those leaders, get it, because we are the ones making the difference. Because Puerto Rico, you know where it is? In a little committee called the House Committee of Natural Resources. We're up there with the Josimet and the Niagara Falls and whatever, and El Yunque, and that's where the decisions are being made, that where they start making decisions about our island. And that's what we have to change. We, have, we need our own committee. Gracias. I think Puerto Rico, nine million people that are US citizens, 
need their own committee and not be mixed with all these other things. So, okay, we'll see if anybody else. I, you know, I, I think you yeah. had it in the right, the, the yeah. same place that I, would, uh, I said. And I, I look at it when people say, you know, get people to go vote. Um, and I remember my own experience because I, I decided to do a foolish thing and run for office one time. <laughs> I never did it again. You but sure? Yeah, but, but what I realized um, during that experience is that during that experience and two others, we registered mm -hmm. more people than anything else. All the, all the things we used to do, these little fairs, everything we did, we couldn't get people to the vote. We couldn't get people to register. But I ran... And that mobilized double the people that were that were registered. The next person that ran was a Puerto Rican judge. This is in Buffalo, New York. Six percent of the community at that time was Puerto Rican, and he won. He won because we had a block of votes that started with me and ended with him. And then right after that, we elected the first city council person, and then the next thing you know, you know, it began to uh, to reverberate. Those some of those games were losses because people stopped running. The person who ran, stay, stay, stay. There was not that excitement. Nothing excites people more and gets them to vote and register than to see a Puerto Rican in a race. Mm -hmm. So I'm all for more, more, more. Get more people running. The more the better. The competitions are good. And, and you learn from it. I learned, I'm here today, I built a Cassia Network because of the experience I had during that race. Mm -hmm. I lost and I won at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Thank you. Yeah. You want to go first? Sorry. I'm not going to talk about both, but I'm going to talk about something else. You can go first. Okay, no problem. <laughs> so about voting, I, I agree with everybody else that we need to get our community to vote. I see that they work in South Florida, that Jimmy, Erica Gomez, uh, different allies, you know, the, in the community have done has been remarkable. But I also want to say that we need resources. We need more attention from the Democratic Party that is really, I'm on the DNC, and I tell you, uh, I'm shocked about how no existent Puerto Rico is within the DNC. I'm going to say here openly to everybody. I say it already to, to Tom and to Keith, Ellison, and others. So uh, how do we make, again, uh, ourselves uh, be present, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to convince uh, unions to invest uh, on uh, organizing groups of workers that include large numbers of Puerto Ricans in Florida and in other states. Uh, we need to... Uh, convince uh, unions, foundations, and others to pour more resources. Uh, what we did in Florida with so few resources was incredible. Uh, and when you look at how many resources are put in other states, uh, it's a very significant inequity uh, what uh, that state is receiving on the Latino vote and the Latino organization. I also feel that it's important to find candidates and recruit them, but I would argue that to get them elected and for them to actually benefit our community in the end, they should also have substance on the issues that affect our community, which are issues that sometimes are unique, but all too often are common. So uh, candidates that care about working families, that care about uh, you know, health care, education, housing, issues like that, uh, I think will be more electable uh, beyond uh, our community, while they could be from our community, because we have talented people who can represent the interests of all from a Puerto Rican perspective. Mm -hmm. And then last, I would like to offer that um, it's incredibly important too that when we look at the electoral process, we don't just do it from election to election, short term, short term. We need to have a 10-year plan to build power for the 5 million Puerto Ricans that are here uh, and benefiting uh, the island. And uh, I know that too often we like to plan for the next month, for the next year, for the next election in 2018. That's all very important. That's what we have. Right now, you know, a famous economist said in the short, in the long term, you are dead, right? So you have to deal with the short term. But we also need to have a long term vision. And if we don't have that long term vision, we're going to fail. And let's learn from how our community built power here in New York and in other cities. The kind of coalitions that were developed between unions, community, businesses that do not exist in other localities. How can we replicate that? We have Melissa Mar Viverito as our speaker in the city council from this district. She would not have been there if the effort had been solely a Puerto Rican effort. So it's kind of that balance of we need to empower ourselves, but then we need to convince others that through us, they can themselves to have power and, and be able to, to connect to them as well. Okay. 
Well, um, I want to talk about, Gretchen mentioned uh, that the best way to help Puerto Rico is by being an ambassador. And that's always something I've always said my entire life. Even when I travel, you know, just give your best behavior, talk well about Puerto Rico, you're an ambassador. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to talk, it's very important to um, get Puerto Rican officials elected. It's very important to get involved with politics. But we have to talk about their private sector in Puerto Rico. And if we want to move the economy, it's going to be their private sector that's going to move the economy. It's not going to be the government. And there are many, there's, we are facing a lot of challenges, but there's also a lot of things that are good things that are happening in Puerto Rico. The technology sector in Puerto Rico is growing rapidly. Right now, uh, just three weeks ago, we were with a president of a Puerto Rican owned technology company who needs to uh, recruit this year 20 software engineers. So there are things happening in the island, and the best way to be an ambassador of Puerto Rico is to talk about those positive things that are happening. Uh, if there's someone that's thinking about planning a trip, tourism, tell them about the amazing place it is, Puerto Rico. If you're thinking of doing a donation, donate to a local nonprofit like we have here, Para la Naturaleza, we have Museo de Arte Contemporáneo. They are doing an amazing job. Um, there's right now, for the first time in 25 years, we only had one investment fund in Puerto Rico. Now we have eight different investment funds owned by Puerto Ricans that are investing in Puerto Rican company. And these are investment funds that are raising funds right now to invest in local companies. That's the way to be an ambassador. If you have, uh, if you have connections to decision makers and companies that are looking for uh, so to lower their costs in their supply chain, that are looking for services or products, do the research. What local companies in Puerto Rico have those services or products that could be an option? That I think that is the best way to be an ambassador of Puerto Rico besides going out and, and voting. Um, so yeah, that, that's a little bit about what I wanted to say because uh, everyone knows that we're facing a, a crisis, but I don't think everyone knows the other side of the story, that it's that the private sector and the non-for-profit sector are doing a big job to, you know, turn things around. Thank you all. I think I'm going to open it up. So I think we, we're going to extend, I'm assuming, a little bit. Okay, I'm going to extend 15 minutes from our 12.30 stop time because everything else got moved a little bit. And I think we want to hear from you. Um, so we want your questions for the panel. So questions are sentences that end in an inflection in your voice. Okay. All right, let's do that. Pan. Okay. <coughs> Estoy de, parcialmente de acuerdo contigo en lo que acaba de decir de invertir en Puerto Rico. Ok, we need to show Puerto Ricans the 5 million plus the 3.5 million that it's okay to invest in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. I was the general manager at a pharmaceutical in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Ok, and we brought the cost down of the product. And we made it very good to do business in Puerto Rico. Okay. But guess what? We were undermined in 1996 mm -hmm. by eliminating the 936. Mm -hmm. we know that. So mm -hmm. that company eventually, upper management was kicked out. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that company went to Costa Rica. So I think right now the voting is good. The information is it getting out to the average Puerto Rican is my question. Mm -hmm. And are we showing them how to become a purchaser? Compra producto Puerto Rico. Dale trabajo a Puerto Rico. Invierte en Puerto Rico. Visita Puerto Rico. Visita Puerto Rico. Un ejemplo que puedo dar, nuestros hermanos dominicanos que viven aquí en Nueva York, ellos van a Santo Domingo, si no cada año, cada dos años. Y van con dinero para invertir. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn from that. Yeah. So my question is, what is each organization doing to get that purchasing power knowledge, to get that investment? Because I've heard different uh, opinions. I just recently got an opinion from Orlando that I was talking to Jimmy about. Uh, a person left Cuomo, he 
yo le pregunto, ¿regresa por acá? So, what is your each individual organization doing? Teach purchasing power. So, I, yeah. Power. So, you know, if, that's one of the things that I, I um, you know, as we we're hearing about it, because everybody has a different different role, and you don't have to. Everybody has to have the same role. Mm -hmm. Mine is all about investment in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, we've invested already. We're going to invest again. We have three more sites we're looking at right now. And every time I go down there, the question you asked in the, in, in the beginning was. You know, I have an idea for Puerto Rico. So I had the, the, the cab driver who go, I mean, gave me his business card. And he says, I do tours. Uh, besides driving this bus, which pays the bills every day, I have this little company that does uh, travels around the island. So, you know, I call them. We have a bunch of things from Puerto Rico. So I'm going to use them regularly uh, as part of touring the island. There are a lot of people trying to sm uh, make small businesses, big investments, little investments. I just can't understand why every Puerto Rican in the United States doesn't go to Puerto Rico twice. Mm -hmm. They're a great resource, great beaches. You know, instead of getting on, on a cruise ship, just jump down there, spend that money in Puerto Rico. Uh, if you don't have family, that's, that's all right. You know, there are small hotels, stuff all over the island that, that try to cater to us. Um, and if you spend money there. Airbnbs. The Airbnbs. I would do the Airbnbs. Anything that's that's has uh, roots you should be looking it's a great vacation i go down there five six seven times a year because i'm always there with business mm -hmm. and i go there for family and you know the whole of chawa no the culinary yeah, right, the right, culinary right. scene i'm right. a foodie right the culinary it's, it's scene is fantastic now. and i have one it's more like, point I, and i don't understand why the the <laughs> tourist <laughs> industry in puerto rico is not catering mm -hmm. to us exactly. i went to El cariba hilton and i wanted to go to the bar with a friend to dance and it was southern music from somewhere in Alabama. Not that I have any problem with Alabama, okay? There was not a Latin band. I went to the club next door in the back. Again, there was another southern band. Uh, I couldn't find a place to do a little salsa with my friend. And I, so that hotels are not catering to us. Hey. Um, uh, yes, you, you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that the category of investing in Puerto Rico, we need to definitely uh, work on that. You know, mm -hmm. we, we come from a coalition that has a lot of labor unions, so we believe very strongly to in raising the purchasing power by raising the incomes of Puerto Ricans here. So they are not the low wage minimum workers, but that they actually pay what their worth and the education levels are usually higher than average in many of the places that they locate. Uh, but even if they're not, they deserve to be paid better. So uh, the more income our community has, whether they are business or workers, the more income is there to invest. But I think that we should also engage more deeply, and this forum doesn't allow enough time, but perhaps after we can connect with one another, there has to be a role for uh, economic development policies in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and a re-examination of our history that has depended on tax breaks, and figure out other ways to develop business and attract business on the island uh, that are not at the whims of Congress. So anyway, I think that's very important too. Hi, how are you? Um, I uh, work with Organized Florida, I'm based out of Orlando. Okay. And um, you know, we have done some campaign work and I wanted to, but my question is really related to the gap that I see on the ground around engaging the diaspora and youth. Um, oftentimes we don't think about, when we think about organizing, how are we engaging parents, you know, and, and the diaspora of young people who mm -hmm. may not understand, you know, really, right, the history of the culture of Puerto Rico and all these other things. So do you have any best practices that you've either tried out or, um, have, you know, experienced or maybe you know other organizations that have done that? Well, I wanted to, um, last year during the panel, I was in the youth panel last year, and out of that panel, it was recommended that you know, youth have to learn more about Puerto Rican history. And Hunter College, they just said, uh, Centro just announced this morning that they have a, in their website, they have a program with quizzes and everything about uh, to teach Puerto Rican history. And they have a boot camp to teach. I mean, is someone from El Centro can talk more about that? But, you know, so there is an initiative here in El Centro about teaching youth Puerto Rican history. Cultural ambassadors. Yeah. We're in the back. And uh, youth is a, uh, a group in society, and as you know, we have 
And the, the cultural piece is very, very important, if I may. And, and with our youth, you know, one of the things that we're pushing in Florida with others is better bilingual education. With the programs and the education in Florida need to be tailored to our community and access to higher ed. I mean, that fight is incredibly important for us to succeed as a people. Uh, so I, so I, I talking echo that. talking about that. Mm -hmm. oh, go. Yeah. I'm going to try to get some questions in. Done some of the things we've been doing. Uh, for example, just having coffee with some of my friends who say, hey, why don't we spend more time in Puerto Rico? Instead of going to Virginia Beach or going to the Montauk, mm -hmm. why don't we go and spend more time in Puerto Rico? We've discovered a lot more than we before because a lot of people who go to Puerto Rico, they go because a family member dies, they stay in a particular town, they come back and say, I can live in Puerto Rico. Did you go in Puerto Rico? Did you visit Puerto Rico? So we started this project called Encuentro Boricua. Mm -hmm. where we are taking kids who are the sons and daughters of New Yorkans, and because I was an ex school teacher and I experimented with my, my own grandchildren, mm -hmm. like, and none of them spoke English, mm -hmm. but I mean Spanish, but when they went there, they came back, and my daughters told me, I'm not going to visit the country, but they, they, they're going to remember this for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do that more often, so we're telling some That's of our awesome. friends. Okay. Okay. is that without money, my, 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 I always learned something my father always taught me. Okay, my market will be no way. And because of the situation in Puerto Rico, I was able to get myself in, in, in a crack where I was able to buy a piece of property. I was able to construct, it took me a social, it took me eight years to finish the house. But I was in a hurry. And the fact is that I finished the house. And I invested by myself. I'm not a millionaire, I don't have a lot of money. I have two, 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 two small businesses in Bronx. But I invested over $120,000 in Cabo Rojo, Puerto Rico. And that was just one person. I now convinced three others, and now they're buying property in Cabo Rojo. This is the time right. I buy. I started in Airbnb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the Airbnb is doing Bronx. great. <laughs> and when I've, been, when I've been showing my friends what I, what I did in the first year, I said, can you make that amount of money and interest in any money you have in the bank? Mm -hmm. With what I made from Airbnb in my first year, mm -hmm. with only one room, but the other side of that is this other part, and this is where I think we need some help, which is the fact it's not just about convincing us to do it. We'll do it because we have we love that flag. Yeah. But we have we get absolutely no help from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. For example, if I if I would have been another person, I swear to you, I would have dropped that project in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Because la bureaucracia in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and the um, lack of support for people like myself. I had to tell my wife when we go to Puerto Rico, mira, I don't, nada más. Don't, don't even say a word in English here because you're, you're in an office and right away somebody then puts you in the back of the line or they don't find your form or whatever. So is there a way for us to talk to the government of Puerto Rico and let them recognize that la diaspora here is better and much more effective than just when there's a hurricane or when there is a catastrophe for us to send water and clothes. 
We can send money. We can send a lot of money. But you've got to make it easier for us. Mm -hmm. Why is it that Panama and other countries have made investments in those countries so that uh, my pension or any monies that I get, if you go to Panama, if you're a citizen of Panama, or some of those countries in Latin America have done I to bring in those, uh, those people who have left to come back, they, they pay less taxes, they get a government office that helps them bring them through the bureaucracy of trying to build a house, and I get those permits backed up. So those types of things we need. And the last mm -hmm. thing is that I noticed because of my friends and myself doing it, because we're doing it already two boys in Luquillo and about three of buying in Cabo The fact is that there is no support also in tourism. I found out that tourism in Puerto Rico spends millions of dollars in trying to get upper class whites to go to Puerto Rico to play golf and whatever because I own a, a sports <laughs> company and I've been invited to go to Puerto Rico to write articles about these incredible golf courses. But yet there is no very little money invested in That's trying right. to get people like me or my son or my daughters mm -hmm. who will be willing to go to Puerto Rico but nobody tells them anything about Puerto Rico except their grandfather and their father. So we gotta be honest. Mm -hmm. We gotta tell people in Puerto Rico, you need help. We wanna help. But of course you gotta do something to provide us. I, just, I want to make one. I want to, I want to make one comment about that because I did. I did go to Puerto Rico four years. Ago. Us, we are yeah. like in the last yeah. Yeah. five minutes. I found that for me, because it was a big project, and I had a million dollars on the line that, that belongs to my organization. That what I found a partner in Puerto Rico, that th all that disappeared. That what I did is I created somebody from the island that understood the island because people have been there dealing with that bureaucracy for a long time. Once that happened things move real smooth and we got, we got through this process. Very complicated process, fairly well. So my advice, find a partner, somebody down there, to, the two of you together, you can open a lot of doors. That's the diaspora and the island coming together. You'll have a million dollars, but maybe less than <laughs> Even a hundred dollars. Yeah. Yes, uh, just for context, my name is Reverend Raymond Rivero. My, my father and came here in 1941. I was born in 1946 and I got here. So I've been a pastor for, uh, a Puerto Rican pastor for 50 years, just celebrating my 50th anniversary as a pastor in New York City. So I've seen a lot, right? And, and the tension is that you really have to think almost hard the last time that Puerto Rican appeared in print in New York City. Mm, yeah. So we've been eradicated as a national identity and the Latino umbrella have, has absorbed right. the Puerto Rican identity. Yes. So then, right. how do you manage that tension with Hector's perspective of coalition politics, but when all of the energy goes into the in, in, into the immigration issue, rightly so, but the Puerto Ricans are still the highest, we have the highest dropout among Puerto Ricans than even Dominicans and other Latino groups. Mm -hmm. those, ten, those, those issues are not highlighted because of, of us managing what does it mean to be Puerto Rican and what does it mean to be Latino. The other thing I want to say, in the whole investing in Puerto Rico, one of the people that most invest money around the world is the church with our mission programs. I have to even condemn myself in the process. Most of my network of churches, we're sending our money to the Dominican Republic and Haiti because the image is that those countries really need the money, while in our minds this upward mobility mindset that Puerto Ricans are still doing relatively well as compared to other uh, Caribbean and Latin American nations. So even though the crisis has helped that, but up until then, kind of we were, we are not, we're not like the other Caribbean countries in Latin America with the images that we're doing better. And, and, finally, and finally, let me say one more thing, I think we also have to engage more of the faith-based communities. Uh, one of the recent examples is the whole Vieque issue, and most people agree that even all the work that was done in Vieque, it was the mobilization of the religious community that finally pushed it. Mm -hmm. When labor and, and all Pentecostales, Evangelico, and Catolico, they all got behind Vieque, as you remember, that kind of pushed the issue. So how do we engage the faith-based communities? Thank you.
Okay. So can we have to. I want to invite everyone at 2:45. We're going to continue this. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think the conversation needs to continue. Um, but lunch has been served, and I am I've been instructed to move us along. So we're going to do this. You guys are going to conclude the panel by telling me this. I wish our diaspora would fill in the blank. You have 10 seconds response each. Come on, just start. I would say everybody in the diaspora should visit Puerto Rico at least twice a year. Yeah. 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 Natasha. Everybody in the diaspora should start considering themselves part of a Puebla na Patria, so it's part of Puerto Rico. We're 9 million. <laughs> Everyone in the diaspora should look out what contacts they know they could uh, um, hire local products or services. Everybody in the diaspora should be organized, spending time, building power in their communities, and if you have a job and you're a worker, build a union. <laughs> <laughs> Basically shows what each one of us stands for. Right. <laughs> 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 <laughs>